let me introduce myself. I'm Mark Sisson. I teach printmaking and drawing here at Oklahoma State University. Today, we're going to talk about how to make an aquatint uh, print. But I want to be a little more clear about, A, what aquatint is and how it relates to the larger part of what we're talking about here. So aquatint is a technique within the realm of etching, which is itself within the larger realm of what's known as intaglio. And intaglio, uh, all that means is you're uh, inking and printing from the valleys as opposed to other forms of printmaking uh, like linocut and woodcut. In that case, you're printing from the uh, surface. Most people don't realize this, but every day they're uh, uh, most people <laughs> are uh, they're, they're carrying around paper money, which is done in engraving. And engraving is another technique under the umbrella of intaglio. In this case, engraving uh, is also uh, generally done on copper, sometimes on zinc. Uh, and uh, it does not have to go into an etch, though, uh, or a mordant. Aquatint and hard ground line, which are a couple of things I'm going to talk about in part of Dual Reed's book, those are etch processes. And in that case, you're letting the mordant and what we're using these days instead of nitric acid or hydrochloric acid like uh, Dual Reed would have used, we're using something called ferric chloride. It doesn't matter what uh, uh, sort of uh, aquatint idea you've got going here pretty much everybody is going to start with what's known as a hard ground line drawing to begin with. And what that means is you're going to put a resist on a copper plate. You're going to coat it with this material that's called a ground or a resist. Sometimes they call it a universal ground. And it's a, a product, a petroleum product made of uh, this material called asphaltum. And it's typically mixed with turpentine or mineral spirits. And this is also, I noticed in Dole Reed's book, and it's painted on, sometimes it's dripped on. We, we actually brush it on here. And then uh, once that's dry, you're ready to uh, uh, actually make marks on the plate here. But prior to doing that, you would typically have a drawing that you would transfer over on here. And we, we typically make a, a transfer paper out of Conte. We just rub this paper with some Conte. And then that lays face down on the plate. And then on top of that, the uh, drawing is then taped. And then just using a ballpoint pen, you go over here. Once your line work, uh, or once you've transferred your drawing over here, you use what's known as a scribe, or sometimes people call it a needle here. And this is where you do your line work. And your line work is, uh, is going to, for aquatint, can serve two purposes. One, it can uh, create a textural area within the aquatint areas that is even richer, and some of the line work will show through. Um, but more often, it's used just to define where your different tonal spots are going to be. So if I know I want a certain tone in this area here, uh, having a line uh, on here that tells me where that's going to be is really critical. This is what's known as a, an aquatent grayscale here. And you need to know how long you need to bite for a given gray value. So, you can pre pr produce tonalities with line work just through cross hatching. That's a very traditional, goes back certainly to the Renaissance. Rembrandt was, was a, a, a particularly noteworthy uh, etcher, and all of his work is, is hard ground. Uh, Aquatint didn't come till much later in, in the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, it, it was uh, one of the best known people, sort of early. Uh, adopters of aquatint was Goya for Los Caprichos and you know some of these other disasters of war uh, series. You can see there's a scale here with numbers on it and these just represent times and those times are cumulative. So this says 30 seconds, this is a minute. So from here to here you would just be adding 30 seconds. From here to here, I'd be adding a minute. From here to here, I'd be adding two minutes. And the goal with this is just to determine 
what my tonal range possibilities are, how long does it take to get to a given gray value, and how long does it take to get to black. So in order to produce something with a broad tonal range like this, you're going to be painting out uh, areas periodically here, and this is all dependent on how many different tonal uh, areas you want here. I know, for example, in this, this artist's case here, what she would have done is the, these would have been painted out right away. Anything that's really bright here, the bright part of the plate, that would have been painted out with this resist here. And this is somewhat related to, to this here. It's thicker uh, and more impervious to the uh, etch than this is, but they're made of similar ingredients. and. Um, it, it looks like this awful sort of tar s substance that it smells pretty bad and you know it's nice to use in a well ventilated area. <laughs> but these various stages of what's called stopping out or blocking out could take a minute or two, could take hours depending on how many little things need to get blocked out each time and that's all based on how much detail you have, how, how many different little things need to be addressed. Once you have your line drawing done, and this is an old student piece that uh, I think you can see has got some line work on here, and uh, the, the, any line drawing is, is uh, perfectly serviceable for Aquatint, just it depends on whether you feel like you need it. Uh, I also have a, just a plain plate because I'm thinking it might be easier to see the dust on this when we do this next uh, technique. So this is the true uh, aquatint uh, phase here. And this here, this contraption is known as an aquatint box. And, and what it is is it's a fan. And there's a receptacle down below here that's filled with rosin. I'm just going to turn this on for a sec. I have to turn it on for at least 30 seconds because that's how the timer is on this. What that's doing is kicking up a cloud of this rosin in there. Once this finishes its cycle, the reason we wait about a minute typically is because there's heavier particles in there and you'd rather have those heavier particles fall down and that way you get the finest dust possible. And the goal again here is to get about a 50% coverage with the dust here so the plate is open. If you got 100% coverage, then there's no opportunity uh, for, for the etch to get in between the dust particles once they're fused. So here's this. Again, ordinarily I'd wait a little bit longer for this, but for expediency, I'm just going to do this here now. And this, you'll definitely see a cloud here come out. This is why you do want a dust mask. See it get all over my hands here. See the cloud in there? Once this dust has fallen on there for 10 minutes, then we take it out and we want to be really careful at this stage because we're going to put it on a hot plate here that, and this would ordinarily be set at 275 degrees so it's really hot and, um, and then you get down pretty low here and you just wait and you'll start to see the rosin melt and that's called fusing the rosin there and once the rosin has, is turned clear basically over the whole thing then you take the plate off here, you turn the uh, uh, oven off here, the hot plate, and uh, you just wait for the plate to cool, and then you're ready to apply the uh, various uh, resists. But I think you guys will be able to see here, especially if you get at more of an angle, and I'll even show you here. Uh, are you able to see okay? So again, here's a hard ground line one, and I'll just, I'll just touch this first of all. Well, maybe that's hard to see, but, but if you do here, so that's disturbed the dust. That's how fine it is though. Then again, this would just be brought over here, slid onto there, fused. 
Usually fusing takes six, eight minutes, something like that. Take it off. Then you're ready to take it back to your table and paint out anything that's going to be white. After all the blocking out has been done and you've etched it for the uh, amount of time that you felt was necessary based on your scale, you would bring your plate over here and you would just put some mineral spirits over it and you'd let it sit on there for a little uh, period of time because it'll have a lot of this black uh, asphaltum resist stop out over everything. So you've got to get that all off of there. And then typically we remove the uh, uh, the aquatin itself, the rosin with alcohol, that, that's the solvent for it. And then you're going to end up with something like this, right? A plate like this. And so I'm just going to do a little bit of the starting part of this, just so all of you can see. This, this is a very messy process. It's a little bit labor intensive. And um, because of that, it's a, there's a real finesse to doing this and doing it well, and I guess more importantly, doing it consistently. So depending on how many you want to uh, uh, print. You want a, what they call a buttery ink here. <laughs> I remember when I first did etching, my uh, in instructor would always say, you want a copious quantity of ink. Uh, and these things really suck up a lot, but basically you're just gonna work this over the whole thing. But again, I'm just gonna do a little area here just so you can see here. And probably even from where you are, you can see you know, in the light there. And then you're gonna uh, take the excess of this off here. But you've got to hit the whole plate, unlike what I'm doing here for this demo. And then you're going to gradually start removing the top layer of ink. This is the challenge, because most students struggle and they wipe too hard. Avery is nodding over there. It's, it's hard. I'm going to take us a little more of this off here. And again, this is the finesse part of this. And then you're just going to gently Start removing the top most layer. If you scrub too hard, you'll pull the ink out of the valleys, but that's not what you want to do, right? What we want to do now is we want to get the, the uh, ink off the surfaces here. So anywhere there isn't a valley, that's what we want to do here. And you kind of keep looking for you know spots that aren't too saturated on your cheesecloth. This, this cheesecloth is a special kind of cheesecloth that's had starch put in it, and it's called tarlatan. And so you're just gradually, and, and people say, well, how do I know? How, what's enough? You know, well, because it takes, again, some practice, and it takes knowing your plate to know what's required here. And then eventually you can get to, to where you're working with these that are a little bit cleaner. but I'm still removing ink here. Part of this is also about, you know, again, knowing when to use these things. It takes a little bit of practice, you know, to get to that. And, it, and you learn your own plate so you know what's required of a given area. Uh, and uh, so, you, again, so you're not overdoing it. This is what I like to do when I get up to, down to about this point here. I guess I can leave this glove on here. It's called a, they call it hand wiping or palming. It's working a kind of a ray pattern here. You can see some is definitely coming off there. A little bit easier to see the image area here, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a little tonal looking here, but you can definitely see a range of values on there. They're definitely real shiny spots now on there. Those, are, those will be the lightest things here. I'm just going to set that right there. Just kind of center it between those there like that. One of the things we're going to try to do here is force this paper down into the valleys to pick all this stuff up. And even though it's, it's pretty narrow, you know, these spaces aren't 
you know, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of an inch. But paper isn't that compliant. I'm just going to pull this out of here. Drain off some of the excess. So you want the paper uh, damp, but not wet. If it's too wet, it'll reject the ink. Uh, if it's too dry, it won't be compliant. So you're looking for that happy medium. And again, for this, this paper, you want to be in there for at least 30 minutes. And this is a lot of uh, pressure here that this is on, goes under. I think it's properly set there already. And usually with aqua tents, I run them back and forth. You can definitely feel this. It's work. Ready for this? And again, you can you can see what she would have blocked out here originally would have been these areas here that are the brightest before it went in. And then, you know, this is probably her next tone here. And then, you know, gradually you can see darker tones uh, beyond that. That is the entire process.